Welcome to Boom, where we have biomechanics on our minds. Boom. 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 All right, welcome back to Boom. We're here with Professor Allison McGregor, who is a professor of musculoskeletal biodynamics in the Department of Surgery and Cancer at the Imperial College in London. And you also manage the Human Performance Lab Group. So welcome. We're really, really excited to have you, Allison. You came highly recommended by one of our listeners when we put out a survey asking our listeners, you know, who should we talk to next? Um, your name was high on the list. So we're really, really excited. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's good to be here. So we always like to start out by asking our guests uh, the question, when did you first know that you wanted to be a biomechanist? Oh, um, that's a difficult one for me because I started life out as a physiotherapist. So I practiced physio for, I don't know, two or three years. Um, and I found out that I quite enjoyed finding out what was wrong with people, but I found treating them mm. quite boring. Um, <laughs> and so I don't think I really knew what I was getting into. I did a master's in bio um, medical engineering. Um, which was a bit of a baptism of fire and an introduction to engineering after you've done a, a clinical job. Um, and I really loved it. I really, uh, at first I was overwhelmed by stress in a beam. Um, and then I actually got really inspired and challenged by it. And I kind of went from doing that master's and I kind of think of it more as falling into research. Um, but my research yeah. was always biomedical engineering style of research. And I've always sort of worked with engineers uh, and used my clinical knowledge or my clinical background and my acquired engineering knowledge to to channel into my research and I suppose it was doing that master's was the thing that propelled me into doing research because the the university I was with offered to do, offered me a PhD and I was a bit like what don't you have to be clever to do one of those um yeah. <laughs> and that kind of got me thinking. And I didn't end up staying at that university. I went to a completely different one. But um, I think it was the challenge of research and using engineering things to understand the human body that really just got me fascinated. And, and I think once you start, you don't really stop, do you? You just keep getting fascinated and you start asking. <laughs> you ask a question and you end up finding 15 others that need answering at the same time. So it's a kind of constant challenge. And that's... <laughs> kind of why I've stuck at what I'm doing. I'm curious if you found ways to use that challenge to give you energy, because it sounds like you really embrace the challenge of it. And I know sometimes those challenges can feel discouraging when you're trying to answer a question and then all these other ones pop up. And <laughs> uh, But uh, how have you been able to use that to your advantage and passion? I suppose, I suppose when I first started doing my PhD, it's like everyone around me seemed to have all these ideas. And I was like, oh, my God, why did these people get all these ideas from? How did they work that out? And then <laughs> as I started getting into my PhD and understanding it, I realized all the things I hadn't thought about and all the things I could have started. And I suppose um, I do actually think all human beings have an inherent com competitiveness in them. And I suppose mm. the research thing tapped into my inner competitiveness. So I was never going to be an Olympic athlete, but I found that the, the challenge of science fed into my competitive nature and I just really got enthused by mm. it. And um, and, I, and I suppose there's the sort of sense of making care better for patients, but it was, you know, understanding what we're doing and making people's lives better is sort of also behind that challenge. You know, what, what can we still do? How can we still make things better? Um, and, you know, as a career, you never get bored if you've got a constant challenge. There's always something to inspire you or mm. something you haven't thought about or something to have a go at. So, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess clear. that's the reason. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's exciting. You uh, f found a way to sort of funnel that energy and it's made you quite productive, like looking at your publication record. It's super interdisciplinary and it's clear you've been able to uh, ask and answer a lot of different questions in lots of different fields. Um, and so just to get a better idea of what you're currently working on, could you share some of the projects that you're currently excited about that are going on either in your group or in a collaboration with another group? So one of my more excited, well, one of the projects I get very excited about is the work I do with the military veterans and um, our amputee court and it, mm. cohort, and it's, it's about their long-term health. So we've been doing a lot of work to try and understand 
um, structural bone changes. So they have um, a sort of stress unloading osteopenia. So we've actually been able to say this isn't a hormonal thing. This isn't um, a biological thing. This is a stress related mechanical response that the bone's becoming weaker Mm. because we're not challenging it. Um, and now the next stage is what do we do about it? So um, that I found quite mm. interesting. And we're also looking at why they have high rates of arthritis and back pain. And and why I find that I think it's, it's for me, it matches my clinical um, engineering interface because I'm using my clinical knowledge and I'm using my research skills and I'm using my engineering terms. And I work with um, such a host of different people. So the bone structure, I'm working uh, with one of my colleagues in civil engineering who does structural FEA modelling of bone. Um, for the arthritis, I've been working with a, a veteran who did a PhD with us and also um, um, a biomedical engineer who's a musculoskeletal modelling expert. I work with colleagues in the States. It's very multidisciplinary and we're bringing lots of different viewpoints to find solutions to their health issues so it's it's they're an inspired group of people they're inspiring to meet because um the way they cope with their injuries and the way they address their life I just find them a fascinating cohort and they're very rewarding to work with so that's one area where I'm and I also do some Mm -hmm. research on back pain with them um Mm -hmm. and then there's some more uh clinical projects I would call them so we're doing some things around back pain uh, and that's trying to understand how we can manage it better and how we can Mm. um, develop self-management paradigms and although that doesn't sound very engineering it starts bringing in things like digital health so how can we work with um, designers to design digital platforms and use use code and algorithms to make clinical decision making for people to help them get better um Mm. I've got some work on there's some more work on the COVID pandemic which I know you want to ask me about later um I'm trying to think because I can't remember all of my different student projects and they'll be in the background killing me for it but I suppose because I've got that different insight and different way of looking in things I get pulled into lots of directions I'm very keen and this is linked to the amputees but also to diabetes we've been developing through working with um, people in uh, electrical engineering different types of sensors for measuring pressure and possibly shear within things like amputee sockets or within footwear Mm. Um, and it's then seeing how we can translate that into something that's really important clinically so um, socket fit is a big dilemma in amputees we talk about a, a good fitting socket but nobody knows what they mean by that and we have no measurements of what quantifies a good fit, what is acceptable pressure over a bony prominence. Uh, and in diabetic foot care, when you get people with ulceration, you know, if we could understand the changes that are going on inside their foot or inside their shoe, mm-hmm. could we prevent an ulcer before it happens? And that's a case of having information, using things like machine learning and AI to work out how we can use algorithms to see what's going on. And then looking about mm, yeah. how we translate that into something that a clinician and also a patient will understand and listen to. Um, the problem with all that is they're not the most attractive areas to get research funding at the moment, but there's some of the things we're mm. doing uh, that are quite exciting. And then I have more clinically yeah. related projects on speak with speech therapists um, and occupational therapists and things like that that are going on in the background. So it's all a bit diverse and a bit That's- different. Um yeah yeah that's really amazing I'd love to talk more I love to learn more about all of those different areas independently and then also how you manage them together one thing though I'm I've been really interested in is digital health and you talked about um, how initially you might not see the the engineering portion of that might not be super clear and I'm curious if you could share more about the role of a biomechanist in designing digital mm-hmm. health platforms or in these self-management programs and the importance of, of that perspective and expertise as those are um, kind of a booming field there. Yeah, uh, and I think it's, it's it becomes a partnership because um, y- y- your engineer knows what's digi- you know what's capable, what you can use code for, how you can program something. And a clinician knows how they think and what they want to see. And it's 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 finding a meeting of the ways and also bringing the user into it. And that user can be a clinician, it can be a patient, it can be a combination. And it's 
being able to say to them, it's not possible to do what you're asking, but we can do this. So it's always this trying to establish a partnership and get clear terms. And I think one of the, the things for me in my career that's been an asset, and I talk about it as being bilingual, um, not that I can speak any other ang- language apart from English, Australian and Scottish, um, but I can talk about it. I can, I can hold a conversation with an engineer and I can hold a conversation with a clinician and I don't get terms mm-hmm. mixed up. Mm-hmm. And when I have that meeting with clinician and engineers, I can say to the engineer, they don't mean that, they mean this. And, and vice versa. So mm-hmm. it, it's being prepared to say, I don't understand and being prepared to to listen to what you're trying to achieve uh, and making sure you're all coming at it from, from the same angle and that using lots of visualisation and examples of what you could do with data. And I think the other thing that you often, and it's the same with app development as any innovation that you use for clinical care, is make sure the clinician understands the time process because, um Engineers can, with time, design anything just about, but with time. And I think um, clinicians are used to working in a pressured environment where they want something yesterday. So when they talk to someone, they think they're going to have a solution Mm. in a couple of weeks. uh, And they don't realise that a design process can take two years and that that writing an app isn't always simple. So I think you, you can see... We have students that write little apps to do things, but sometimes what they're asking is really complicated. So anything where you're you're combining an app with that collects data and then does some post processing on it and then visualizes mm-hmm. it, that's not as simple as they think. So I think sometimes it's just got to tell them this isn't something I can do on the back of an envelope tomorrow. It's going to take time to get this algorithm right, and actually what I might have to do is find some potential solutions and talk them through with you because I think that's one of the, it, it's getting the terms of engagement right. And I think there's some really good apps and there's some ones that aren't so good and, and it's it's factoring what the clinician thinks it's going to do. And sometimes what mm. they want it to do is to make them, their lives easier, but they don't, um, or they say they want to see data. So I quite often, I've had recently a few people since we've moved to our new lab say, oh, I want a full gait analysis. And I say, well, what is it you're interested in? I can measure anything you want, but mm. you tell me what it is you think is going to help you manage that patient. Because if I don't have that, I'm not going to be able to provide you. I can give you loads of pretty graphs, but you're not going to know what they mean. And and that's the sort of thing you have right, to yeah. think about with, with those technologies is what is it do they really want? And actually, if you give them a number that goes ping, what does it mean? Is it going to change how they care for their patient? Because if it's not, it might not actually be useful to them. So it's a mm-hmm. yeah. I don't know if yeah, that's that answered question, the question. I think I've rambled a bit. Anyone. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. I think that's a question we often find ourselves ask, and it's like a like a lesson you learn over and over, right? That you need to, you know, what do you want to measure, or what question do you want to answer? What do you have to measure? You know, what's the margin of error, and then how will you act with that information, right? That whole pipeline, and it's really cool that you're able mm-hmm. to talk to you know all of the different stakeholders involved and speak those different languages and it's also how do you want it to change your patient's care what are you what are you going to Mm, use to change the decisions you make about what you do with that patient and that's where they don't really know sometimes Mm. Mm -hmm. how often so sometimes you you actually have to pin them down yeah pin them down because they will (laughs) evade and they they like to have you know you've got early adopters of technology who like anything that looks technological it, oh, I'll, I'll try that because it looks good but you actually have to say some but what are you going to use it for because actually it won't be used unless there's a specific reason to use it mm. right right and, and Hannah was talking about how we often ask ourselves that sometimes or ask each other that in the lab I'm curious from your experience on the other side of that and asking that question a lot do you have advice for how mm-hmm. someone who's coming to you with that problem and maybe not exactly sure or has that clarity how they can get that clarity in order to move forward and and figure out what it is exactly that they want yeah and I think it's just trying to get people to break down what they're trying to achieve um and it's just getting people to be more specific because I think we use a lot of terms when we're not very specific so 
Um, oh, well, I want to see if their biomechanics are different. Okay, well, what is it you think is different? And, yeah. and, and a lot of time you can say to people, well, what is it that you're seeing in your clinical practice that makes you think this, this is important? What is it that mm. you're, what trends are you observing? And, and a lot of time in clinical practice, you observe things. And actually, when you do science on them, they're absolutely rubbish. It's just something you've got in your head. But, you know, or you say to them, why do you think this is important what what bits of science are telling you that's important so then you can start pulling it apart and pulling the argument apart and seeing what it is that they're either think they're seeing or what they're doing with their clinical reasoning so usually when you practice as a clinician a patient tells you certain things or you see that they work walk in a certain way or um you assess a joint and you see certain things and, and in your head you you do this processing oh they've got this and they've got this and they've told me that okay it could be this that's wrong with them so what you try to do with a clinician particularly is unpick what's going on in their brain which we call clinical reasoning but how did you get to the decision that that might be important for that person what is it that what did you see or what did you know about their anatomy or their their physiology that made you think that that's important for them and it's trying to sort of unpack their their bold statements that they make what is it that makes you think that why do you think that is important Mm. I like that. Yeah, I think I, for, when as you were talking, I was reminded of when I took a drawing class once, like they said, draw what you see, not what you know. And I think that sort of applies here where like you shouldn't, yeah, you've really got to depend on your observation and the sort of synthesis of what's being presented rather than maybe what you might know or depend on in order to get to these new insights and in order to um, yeah. yeah, and it, it's how do you capture their, their exper- sure. years of experience where they just, right. you know, we talk about a feel of a joint or a feel of how something moves. Well, okay, what is it? It's quite a hard thing to then describe, <laughs> but try and get them to talk you through yeah. it and say, what is it that you're, you you feel? What's different? Is it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, just try and get them to be more descriptive, which they're not used to doing, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it sounds like you do a lot of like uh, sort of qualitative investigation, you know, in the at this process with clinicians and then trying to figure out sort of what the need is. Um, and you've authored a lot of different publications on that sort of highlight user, this user uh, needs finding side of your work. Um, and so I'm just curious what other methods you found useful in doing this type of needs finding and like um, and just, yeah, what your experience has been in that. So I think it depends on the project. If it, it, It's trying to define that there is a need for what you're trying to do. So I think often we get ideas and there's, there's, a, there's a tendency in sight. Well, there used to be a tendency where we could just get an idea and go off and do it. But whereas now to get funding, you've got to justify why you're doing it and show that there's a need and it's going to make a difference. Um, and I suppose what you hear with innovation or new devices, and I suppose it was developing some devices that made me start thinking more about looking at what patients really want because you can design something but actually the patients won't use it if they don't see the point of it or they can't use it or it doesn't make sense to them so I think that's where we started thinking about what would a patient really want and and I I've done some clinical studies and it gets really important in clinical studies to know that if you design an intervention, will the patient actually want to do it? Or is it so hideous that they'll never do it? So I suppose if you ever think about um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. when you do a patient information sheet, my rule of thumb with ethics is would I do it or would I have one of my own, one of my family do it? Uh, and that's that's my test mm. of whether I take part in it or, or I, the level of um, thing I'd ask of a subject to do. So and it's thinking that if I presented this to a member of my family, what would they want to know? And would that be acceptable? And and we started doing this on a sensor device because we knew that to get people to engage with exercise, they needed something to motivate them. So there's lots of stuff about, you know, you can strengthen muscles to treat arthritis or exercise is one of the best treatments. But mm-hmm. we know as a population, people's adherence to World Health Organization guidelines on exercise is appalling. Um, I mean, it's for me, it's shocking how few people do the daily activity recommendation. So how do you motivate someone? And, and that gets you into things like behaviour change, which makes you think people have to recognise what they're not doing. 
Um, but if you're designing a tool to change someone's behavior, it's got to be something that they're prepared to use. So, you know, Fitbit's sword, you know, became uber popular because they were easy to wear, easy to use. They interface mm-hmm. with your phone. It was accept- It became acceptable. I mean, there's a time a few years ago that might not have been acceptable to patients. Um, so we were trying to design a a device to wear on your knee to help people with arthritis and it was really I found it really fascinating because one of the things we got back from our user group is they would not wear leggings they would not they did not want a device integrated into leggings yet we all know how many people Mm. are out there wearing leggings some who should be and some who shouldn't be so you know it was really interesting (laughs) so we were thinking of integrating it into leggings and that was immediately out of order where that wasn't going to be acceptable to our patients they didn't want that Mm. so it's quite interesting because you think about things for clinical translation and you've also got to think is what would people be prepared to do and I think that's why we've started going into qualitative research um or doing things like surveys to understand what people really needed or what what people really believed Mm. to be And, and I suppose it almost goes back to your other question about how do you engage with people for a digital technology and it's it's trying to find out what people believe by the term digital technology because I think there's lots of words out there but people don't always understand what they mean and they don't really know can't articulate what they want from it so I think if you then talk to a range of experts you can start getting more information about what the consensus is or what people would really want and if you want your innovation or your your um care disruptor to make a difference you've got to get those opinions first because then you don't have to design something and then try and sell it to the clinician or the user or the patient or the world to take that bit on and I think for me um, engaging with some more different types of research and working with the qualitative experts been it's just been Um, really fascinating and it also highlights some of the things I think we make assumptions about what's wrong with people or what they struggle with and you know it might be with the amputees you know we uh, seeing the um, prosthetic arm behind you makes me think of that you know the hook (laughs) the hook hand is still one of the best prosthetic limbs because it's simple to use and it might not look nice but Mm. it gives them functionality But just actually asking them why they don't wear their prosthetic gives you whole loads of insights into what we need to design better or what we need to change. Mm -hmm. And often they come up with things that you would never have got from a survey or you would never have got from a normal biomechanical Mm -hmm. study. So sometimes it highlights that actually it's not the cosmetics that's important to them, it's something else or it's not the, you know, they don't wear their Mm -hmm. hand or their artificial limb because their socket is so uncomfortable. So actually the socket's the issue, not the prosthetic. Um, And, you know, I think it just gives you a different perspective when you start talking to people about what really their problem is and it helps you design the solution in a better way. Yeah, yeah. And I guess it probably makes you think about the range of problems that people might be experiencing Mm -hmm. and how different they can be for different people. But having that insight from one person might be able to help another person with a similar problem. But I'm sure it it just seems when I work with patients, I'm just constantly surprised by the challenges that they face that I, from my own experience, would have never been able to guess. Yeah. And the other interesting group to talk to is sometimes their carers or their significant other, you know, what? because they can actually have a huge impact on whether somebody embraces something or not or how they they manage their condition. It's, you know, um, I think with old people, it's a real example because what we're all prone to do is, oh, you know, you're nearly 80. You shouldn't be going up and down ladders or you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, uh, My parents have done this. They live in a bungalow, you know, with no stairs. So every time they come to my house, I make them go up and down the stairs because I know from my colleagues' work Mm -hmm. on osteoporosis, Mm -hmm. you're not loading your um, neck of femur appropriately if you're not doing deep flexion. So I need them doing deep flexion Mm -hmm. so they don't break their hips when they fall over. There you go. You know, it's it's that whole thing of we wrap people up and we make assumptions of what they should do and actually we should yeah, be pushing them exactly. to their limits and making them do more but you know we think oh you know they're not well they've got this so we wrap them up and actually we need to say to people that it's your behavior that's stopping them that's that's not the problem it's right. your the problem um right or it's easier yeah, to push somebody well, around in a wheelchair than to wait them. 10 minutes yeah. yeah so it's it's those sorts of things that yeah. are interesting yeah I'm always curious when we talk to people who are sort of experts in needs finding, how did you come to this realize, like, were you naturally a question asker? Or, um, I mean, it sounded like you 
started to be after your master's and then going into your PhD. Yeah, like, I suppose. I feel like there's still a lot of people that master miss. Master communicator, yeah, really, that, and translator. Right. <laughs> and there's people that miss this lesson somewhere. Like, I feel like I missed it early. You know, I started my PhD in the literature rather than like going, you know, it, it took me a while to figure out how to go out. But I think that's how you'll talk to, isn't it? You'll talk to start with your literature search and not talk to the people. And I suppose it's because mm, I came yeah. from a medical background and, um, you know, the one thing you have to do is talk to patients and, and ask them questions about what's wrong with them. Yeah. Otherwise, you can't, you get more from talking to the patient about their diagnosis than you do from assessing them. And I always say that to the medical students and they go, oh, oh my God, oh my God, I've got to talk to a patient. But actually <laughs> asking them about their symptoms tells you much more about what's wrong with them than examining them sometimes. The examining is just confirming what you've you've done with your hypothesis in your head. So it's, it's learning yeah. to use your instincts around you. Um, so, and I suppose all I've learned to do is combine that with um, reading scientific papers and engineering stuff. And, and I suppose also um, design principles and how you implement things and implement change. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I've never seen that parallel. I really liked what you just said there where like, I think diagnosing or like, you know, assessing a patient is you do the scientific process, you observe you make your hypothesis yeah. and then you test it with your, you know, mm -hmm. clinical exam or whatever. Whether it's your test or your yeah. examination or your blood tests or your imaging. Yeah. yeah. It's the same sort of thing. They're not so different. Huh. Yeah. That's so interesting. It, it also made me laugh when you talked about asking caregivers and, and the other stakeholders involved. Um, I was talking to a clinician recently and we were talking about clinical tests, a sit to stand test specifically. And how she recently had a, a patient come in and, and he did the the test. And then uh, when he went to the restroom, his wife was like, he was really showing off there. He <laughs> never moves that fast. And, you know, it's just so different than what you see at home. And um, so I thought that was, yeah, kind of made me think of that and laugh that, you know, people that are close to them also have a different and unique perspective um, mm -hmm. that is insightful to the clinicians and, and engineers that are designing for them. And I think it's that whole thing is we can measure things in a lab, but that doesn't mean that's how they're doing it at home. Or as one of my postdocs used to call it out in the wild, you know, when you're outside or when you're not being observed, well, we don't actually know what people are doing outside of that, that laboratory. Mm -hmm. So we can get a beautiful assessment of somebody's gait in a laboratory, but that doesn't mean that's how they're walking outside or in the home or right. on a daily basis. And that's sort of yeah, our challenge yeah, is how exactly. do we capture the whole picture and not just bit of the picture. Yeah. I was also curious with the lower back pain and mm -hmm. studying spinal biomechanics, integrating that biomechanics portion to lower back pain management. I know lower back pain is one that is such a, requires such a multimodal rehabilitation process of, you know, the psychology of it and the pain education of it. And, mm -hmm. um, there's so many different components, but I'm curious on the, on the biomechanical side, I know you also do some simulation work with the spine and, and better understanding spinal biomechanics. And, and how do you specifically, I guess, with that example, integrate what you're learning in a biomechanics lab and with the simulations mm -hmm. into actual lower back management or, or treatments for it? Yeah, and, I, and I, it, it's really hard. And I think the problem is we don't understand back pain. And I don't think people totally yeah. make it up. I, mm -hmm. it, it used to be known as the thing that people made up. And now we talk about stress. But in the old days, <laughs> you used to talk about having back pain. But I think for most people, there was something involved. There was something that happened, whether it was a muscle strain. That, that, you know, there is something that, that triggered a back pain event. And then you have the psychology that comes with it. And... Um, you know, when you look at the biomechanics, well, we, we do know there's structural changes. We know that the disc, which is just such a, an amazing structure, but it goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And we don't know the implications of that going wrong, but we know it changes the loading through the spine. We know it changes the way people hold themselves and the way people move. Um, and we know it can change the way the muscles around it function. So, mm -hmm. I, th I I always think there is something underlying that mechanics can tell us that might direct the clinical problem. Now, the psychology comes from how you respond to the pain and, and it also then drives the pain mm -hmm. mechanism. But if we can start understanding what is some of the mechan mechanistic bits, whether it's 
um, what constitutes a good spinal posture or what constitutes keeping the spine strong, what muscles are working and how do we make them work better or, okay, we know the discs are a bit degenerate, how do we compensate for that? Then we could maybe get better treatments and, and use some of the biomechanics to drive the change in some of the other psychosocial issues to make people link the things together. So I think it's, I mean, back pain is the prime example of where you've got to throw lots of disciplines at it and try and pull it apart and, and try and understand what really is going wrong. Um and I think we're a long way off because nobody understands how the, the spine actually still functions and does all the things and takes the loads and can manage all the things that it can do. Um, and yet when you look at it from an anatomical or research perspective, it's an amazing design. I mean, it is mm. so clever in what it can do. It's just when it goes wrong. I think like all clever systems, when it goes wrong, it goes wrong. I mean, people love te Tesla cars, right. but apparently you can't change the tyre easily on your own. So it's the same sort of analogy. It's a very complicated <laughs> structure, but, we, you know, it's not easy then to repair it when it goes wrong. And I think um, right. I'm always mindful of a rheumatologist who said, well, the problem with managing back pain is it becomes psycho it becomes perceived as so, psycho as so psychosocial because you don't have a spine replacement. But, you know, some of the mm -hmm. issues that we deal with with psychosocial side are just as important with knee joint replacements and hip joint replacements. But because there's something mm -hmm. mechanical you can replace that joint with, there's a good stop gap to manage those those um, psychosocial issues in a different way that's not just talking therapies or psychological interventions. There's something that people can mm -hmm. do and combine it with those psychosocial so mm -hmm. interventions that then have a bigger impact. But with back pain, we just haven't got there. There's so little we can offer people. But we do know structurally and anatomically yeah. in the muscles and the joints there are changes. We've just got to understand what they mean and how the mechanics link to pain and some of the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the back is complicated because yeah. you don't always get back pain. You get leg pain, and that just makes it even more complicated. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> you get just yeah. this pain and you have – there's so many different – things that can be going into it both physical and and others so it's such a, a complicated yeah. problem but a, a big problem so many people um, face back pain and so it's really amazing to see the ways that you're tackling that problem and another huge problem we've had over the past couple of years is the COVID-19 pandemic and you've recently published on that and some of the repercussions of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we we're wondering if you could um, share your role in, in these publications and some of the studies that you've done on that. So I suppose um, some of the stuff started, I, I have a GP that works in my group who's amazing. I'd love him to be my GP because he's the nicest GP in the world. But um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we're we're quite both of us are quite interested in the role of sedentary behavior in your health and um yeah. and the role of exercise so um that combined with one of the trauma leads we started looking at we knew there were loads of people getting very sick and we we knew early on there were starting to be signs of things mm -hmm. like long covid and that people were struggling to get better um and uh, so we wanted to do something to tackle that. But the other thing we knew was it goes back to what I said earlier about exercise and activity, that most people, um, fitter people were not getting the same impact on their health as more sedentary people and more overweight people. Mm. And I think there was this realisation that, that your health and your quality of health was really important to how you reacted to a disease like COVID. Um so we wanted to, to sort of see how we could capitalise on people changing their perspective about their lifestyles and, and, you know, how did we get people into exercise? And one of the things we came across, well, one of the observations is what I call the New Year's Eve rule. So in this country, people make New Year's resolutions. They're going to do this. And, and I remember years ago going, mm -hmm. I'm going to take up running. And I remember going running for 40 minutes. It absolutely killed me. I did not enjoy it. And I couldn't <laughs> move for two days afterwards. So that resolution of going running every day goes straight out the door because you don't get yeah. fit to do the activity. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think we yeah. started looking at this. What? How could we get people fit to exercise? And how did we understand what the impact of, of local lockdowns was on people? So with David, we had uh, links to our School of Public Health who have different cohorts. So they had a cohort in um, west of London that they were following up with loads of questionnaires about lifestyle and health. 
Uh, and it was mm. it's a, a cohort trying to work with dementia and early Alzheimer's. But mm. what we talked to them about is could we add some extra questions in to look at the impact of the lockdowns on people's health? So uh, what mm. happened if, you know, did you not go out? What was the impact of the disease on lifestyle, things like exercise and activity? So we changed the ethics and we got some extra questionnaires sent out to them. And it was it was fascinating because certain age groups stopped being as active because there wasn't the routes to being active. And, uh, um, you know, women found it harder, especially of a certain age, if they still had kids that they were homeschooling. So their lifestyle gains were the things that dropped. So this led to all the research that started to oh, show no, that sure um, you were... So what we actually did was we joined an epidemiological study which was following up a cohort of patients and we added some activity questionnaires. And from that, we could start seeing the effects of lockdown and the changes to people's lifestyle that that the pandemic brought apart. And and it it, it did. It it depended on your your age group, your gender, um, your ethnic background, how you responded to different things. And we saw, for instance, that single people found it harder to keep up exercise than people who Mm. were in a... Uh, living with other people because the other people motivated them to exercise so we saw that there was this effect um and we were also conscious that some people might not after a lockdown ended if they wanted to restart exercise how did we get them fit so Mm. that's led us to be developing a digital app which is called movement foundations which is trying to get people fit to do exercise so it kind of links into the new year's resolution kind of thing that actually rather than just take up a sport or exercise the app's trying to get you fit enough to then take up the exercise of your choice. So we don't have to prescribe that you go running or you go swimming or Mm. tennis Mm. or whatever it is. This is just getting you basic whole body fitness to then be able to take part in an exercise activity. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's what we're still finalising and finishing off. It'll probably be finished by the time some of the lockdown things have all changed. But um, this whole concept of getting fit to exercise, I think, is really important for so many uh, traumatic Mm -hmm. events in people's lives for um, after you've had a surgical intervention. There's a whole host of host of uses for it that that it will hopefully still continue to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even just as yeah, that's sort of. Yeah. So that's what we've been doing with COVID is how do we get people back into exercise and how do we get them safely to translate mm-hmm. that? Mm. And we don't really want to get into long COVID because that's nobody understands what it is yet. So, it, it, again, it goes back mm-hmm. to really understanding what the problem is and what all their symptoms are. And at the moment, I don't think we understand all the impacts of the disease on everyone's body. Yeah. 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 Um. Well, we'd like to thank you for sharing that. Um, we'd like to switch gears just a little bit as we wrap up with the last few questions here. Um, and we were excited to find that in preparing for this interview, um, an article about a boat being named after you. Um, and I think you sort of christened it with a bottle of champagne as well. Uh, so we'd love to hear that story. <laughs> and just we'd love to like see like sort of these like human parts of of the people we talk to and like the researchers, like you're an extremely accomplished and like incredibly bright uh, human that's made a lot of impact on the fields uh, that you work in. But it's like also fun to see these other sides and hear these other stories. So we'd love to hear about. Um, about so I, I'm chairman of the university boat club, but I have a, a long standing interest in rowing. So that goes back to back pain. So um, <laughs> mm, yeah, uh, the, Oh, the head coach of the boat club, a guy called Bill Mason, who's an absolute lovely man, real character, asked me, can you sort out my rows, get back pain? And I think he just thought it would mm. be a quick answer. But we set off a whole big research program and we worked with the men's eight that won at um, Sydney back in 2000. And then we worked with some of the athletes wow. that won in Rio and then the London Games. Uh, I actually met my husband that way because my husband is an Olympic rowing coach. So the work I've done on rowing biomechanics was how I met my husband. Um, But (laughs) on top of because I had this association with the sport, the academic who was chairman before me uh, and I'd worked, uh, I carried on doing some clinical work with the boat club. So in my own time, I used to help the rowers and do some physio treatments and translate some of the findings that we had from the research into, into the club. So I then sort of got very busy with my career and I didn't do so much and I did a bit more with the um, national team. 
but when uh, the previous chairman came for retirement, he'd asked if I take on the role. So um, there was too much of a history, so I agreed to take it on. So it's just a recognition of all I do to manage the students at the boat club. But it's a great, it's, I mean, it's brilliant fun. We have a lot of laughs. We go to, I go to races and support them. I help them get out of trouble when they misbehave sometimes or get the rules wrong. Um, <laughs> and get to go to Henley uh, and see them race and succeed. So it's, 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 it's just a different way of connecting with people. And um, it, it's, it's also a form of mentorship because a lot of the time you're mentoring them through their university life and the sport mm. they're passionate about and trying to keep them. And I guess I, I, I did all of it because when I used to treat them, I felt that they put um, at our university, they have to be academically high achievers and they all were doing really difficult courses like aeronautical mm. engineering and all sorts of very mm-hmm. complicated courses that required loads of input. But they still managed to compete at a really high level in a really tough sport. Uh, so I just sort of mm. felt it seemed fair to give back to them and support them and help them keep themselves in one place and look after their health. And that's sort of how it started and that's how it sort of stayed. Um, so I've had an association with the boat club since before 2000 um, wow. and still do. So it, and it's, you know, it's wow. it's a way of keeping connected. But um, I, I don't do so much research on rowing mechan- biomechanics now, but I still have the role with the boat club. And so, yeah, I had no idea that day that they named a boat after me. It took me to complete. I kept going, no, but we're supposed to be somewhere else now. Why are we going over to the boat fair? We're meeting people for lunch. And it was like, no, no, trust us, just come. So, yeah, it was quite a big thing. I have had a boat. I had a smaller boat name before years ago, and they crashed that within the first two months of owning it. So, um, but I can tell you that one's still in one piece, probably helped by the fact that they couldn't use it during COVID. But, um yeah. <laughs> well, we're glad to hear that. That's one of my fun roles. And it, yeah, <laughs> it's awesome to hear those relationships mm-hmm. you form through your research, both, you know, with the boat club and your husband. And I won't ask whether it's more exciting to meet your husband or have a boat named after you. Yeah. But um, <laughs> that's, yeah, it's so fun to hear that. And um, I guess speaking of boat crashes or um, <laughs> fails, uh, we always like to ask our guests if there's a time in your career that maybe you felt like you had a failure or you experienced something um, that you weren't expecting and what you learned from that? I think there's always failures. I mean, um, I had to redo part of my PhD, so rewrite part of Mm -hmm. it. And that felt, for me, that was probably the first big hit where things Mm -hmm. hadn't quite gone the way I thought they should go. And I, I, I think before that in an exam, I didn't do very well in my master's. But and it's a bit like big mm. grant applications. And I think you spend your early career worrying about your own salary and your later career worrying about keeping your team together and keeping good staff and being able mm. to support them. So I think where I feel a failure is where I haven't managed to secure the funding to get somebody to transition or keep a postdoc or, or someone who's doing really good work and I haven't got the next bit of funding for them or I've transitioned them mm. into what is potentially lecture material, but there isn't the job for them and they can't get that job and I can't make it happen. But I think grant rejections mm-hmm. are your toughest one in academia and, and you just, because they're the norm, you just have to go, okay, dust yourself down. Um, <laughs> don't, look at, don't look at it. <laughs> don't look at it for at don't least 24 it, yeah. hours. You do, do your yeah, initial rank and just park it for 24 hours and then come back and then say, okay, what what didn't I explain right? How could I have made that better? Mm-hmm. Uh, where have they missed my arguments? Or... Um, what did I miss in the literature or what did I not put together? You know, where where have they pulled me up on this grant? And I think it's something, uh, grantmanship is something that we don't often think about. Um, And uh, a a colleague in public health got me into thinking about grantmanship and he said, you know, the art of a good grant is um, the reviewers going through and they find something wrong in the first paragraph and you've answered it by the second paragraph. So they started scribbling, I've got Mm. them, I've got something put up with and then they go oh they knew that let's pull that out so it, it's, <laughs> it's trying to think ahead of the game and, and and I think it's where you have to think okay what did I totally misread the call uh and that's where you then start having to say okay when I'm applying for funding am I actually bang on the nail and usually it's worth having a conversation with mm-hmm. the funder but then when you get the rejections it's trying to say is it something I could have 
done better or were there just better grants out there and it was a really competitive thing and I've got to just make it that bit better but I think that's that that's where you feel Mm -hmm. a failure is when you you lose a grant application and people's jobs rely on it and you just feel you've let them down um Mm, yeah but you know you also have to realize that you're not in control of those things and you can only do what you can do but I think unfortunately science isn't a very aggressive aggressive field and you have to learn to deal with failure and not take it personally right yeah I feel like it's easy to say and hard to do oh yeah look it's it's <laughs> I think it, I've had so much practice now I've become more pragmatic and it's it's developing that resilience and um yeah and then it's when you do get success enjoying it and making the most of it and and actually mm. celebrating it mm. and I think also it's it's sometimes in to yourself we have to learn to be kinder to ourselves and actually sometimes it's really hard to keep pushing yourself and keep beating yourself up for the things you haven't done but actually you also have to say but I did do this and I have done that so actually Mm -hmm. it's not all bad there's lots of good in what we do and how we support each other and be kinder to each other is really important absolutely absolutely well we are coming up on our last question now. And thank you. We're just, this has been such a great conversation. I feel like we haven't even stuck to the questions that we sent you. <laughs> yeah, which sorry, is I do that a to good people. sign, right? Like, no, no, that's, yeah, we were like, oh my gosh, this is a way better like conversation. Yes, so yeah. we love when that happens. Um, but before we last ask our last question, which we do keep standard across all our episodes, um, we'd like to know how people can learn more about you and your work. Um, if you're on social media or anything like that, you've got a lot yeah, of Yeah, um, my one of my team keeps telling me she's going to make me do social media, but I I, I don't use social <laughs> media. I'm an absolute hermit as far. But um, I think it's just really my college web pages and then email me because I'm still okay. old-fashioned. Mm-hmm. Okay, so well, that's, about that's that. great to know. You responded really quickly, so yes, yeah. um, that was really exciting to be able to contact you and reach out. And, yeah, um, and, and we'll yeah. add the website for people to to find you. Oh. Yeah, and one day All I right, might so stop being an elephant and I'll embrace it, the social media, but I'm not ready for it yet. <laughs> well, we'll keep the lookout, and yeah. we'll find you when you do. <laughs> um, All right, so our, so our last question that we like to ask is, what are you excited about for the future of biomechanics? It's clear that you're excited about a lot of different things and we've had so much fun talking to you about them through the episode. Mm -hmm. I think what's, I think what's exciting that's happening and I'm not an expert in it. I think it is sadly AI It's how we can use machine learning and different methods Mm -hmm. to actually pull different types of data together and, and look at very complex things in very simple ways. And it offers the ability Mm -hmm. to combine uh, maybe qualitative work with biomechanical work and look at things from a totally different yeah. perspective that we've not been able to do you know when I think back mm. to the um we didn't even have pivot tables when I started my PhD so you know you've lived <laughs> I've lived through this big technological revolution in many ways you know? I couldn't even I couldn't even store my um PhD on a, a disc which I can now store on a pen drive um so yeah. I think it's the capacity to be able to to knit data and look at data mm-hmm. in completely unique ways that we've never been able to do before and, and to be able to process much larger quantities of data because we can automate it instead yeah. of having to do it by hand. So I think that offers mm-hmm. huge advantage, you know, seeing the MRI behind you, how we can do image analysis in, in much more, com- you know, mm-hmm. using um, machine learning to look at muscle structure or fatty deposition. It's just so much. It's, it allows us mm-hmm. to ask so many more questions um, mm-hmm. and break down so many more barriers. So, yeah, I think that's the exciting mm-hmm. thing is the potential for doing so much more. Yeah. It's a good time. And I actually do think. I, and I think this is a totally exciting time because I think for innovation, because of biomechanics and technology, it's a really exciting way for bioengineers to change the practice of medicine and to integrate mm-hmm. with them. So mm-hmm. don't be shy of it. Talk to them and make sure they understand your language. And, and it's, mm-hmm. it's great fun. It's great, great fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing to see you really live that out. And I think you're mm-hmm. a great role model for that and being able to talk the different languages and, and really be able to translate your work as a biomechanist to medicine and to healthcare mm-hmm. and making it more accessible and, and, and having that engineering expertise embedded in that. So 
it's been really amazing to hear all the projects that you're working on that are showing that and, and what you're excited about. So thank you so much, Allison, for taking the time to talk with us. We really appreciate it. You're very welcome. And good luck with the next, the next um, recording. Biomechanics off our mind.